a section on morality and ethics, which of course I think all uh, comes down to shared frames of reference and drawing conclusions from shared frames of reference. So as a human, I can make arguments that um, you know killing humans is wrong. Um, that's why it's part of human morality that to kill is to murder is wrong. Um, we couldn't expect it to be part of an alien uh, mor you know, morality. On the other hand, we might be able to make an ethical argument from the fact that with these aliens, assuming they're living beings, of course, uh, and we're living beings, maybe that I could make an argument from that reference frame we do share of being living beings. There's a section on metaphor, which is, um, is really important. I, um, I'm a big fan of metaphor. I've always believed it's, it's modeling is how science and philosophy always really works and metaphor is really a name for this process of modeling one thing in terms of another thing and trying to draw conclusions and then you know if you add in the fact that after you map that you test the results you can really make a lot of progress and it's wonderful because in the last um, decade or, or two a cognitive science has you know, discovered that human beings think almost entirely with metaphor, that uh, there's metaphor all the way down. Now maybe uh, space and time uh, you can make literal statements about, but we really use those as metaphors in a lot of other cases. And, in, you know, in the case of time, we use a lot of spatial metaphors. So basically, um, metaphor is a wonderful thing, and it's also sort of a, a point that, you know, traditional analytic philosophy has looked down on metaphor as just like something an artist would use. It really turns out it's behind all, all of our thinking. And of course there's lots of metaphor in, uh, in philosophy. So um, it's maybe not admitted. Um, there's a section on simultaneous contradiction, which is the idea of contradictions coexisting, which is possible within relativity and not possible within objectivity. Um, or I should say classical objectivity, because of course there is a form of objectivity, a relativistic objectivity, and um, uh, you know there's there's a lot of me meanings to objectivity. Another section is on objectivity where I'll talk about these different meanings. I mean there's a common sense understanding of objectivity as being you know admitting to, to what's really going on around you. There is um, you know a technical t idea of objectivity uh, that you know we can know things for certain there is a technical meaning uh, of this theory that that something does exist outside us which I of course agree to and then there's the idea of objectivity saying that at our fun foundational level of philosophy we'll base that on objectivity I don't believe that's possible we have to base it on subjectivity because that's all we have is this experience of existence as I defined about you know before um, uh, that's a subjective experience and all of our experiences come through that so you know objectivity is a theory built out of our subjective experiences so um, it has comments on our subjective experiences it helps us figure out which are are less reliable and which are more reliable where reliable means you know useful for understanding reality but ultimately it's still um, made of subjective parts and it is a subjective phenomenon the theory of objectivity I have a section on poet philosophy um, and I just did a video on poet philosophers so that's explained just a, a minute ago um, uh, I have a section on a pair of philosophies which I also mentioned in that video on poet philosophy which is the idea that just people have both um, you know, philosophers tell you one set of ideas, that's their philosophy. They also have behavior, and the, the, there's a second philosophy that you can deduce from their behavior. It's basically the philosophy they would have to have to justify uh, their behavior. And uh, also this applies to animals, so it, it allows us to to consider the philosophy of a particular animal, even if that animal really has no choice. And in a sense, it's not philosophical from a human perspective. You know, a, uh, a tick has a parasitic philosophy. And um, we can use that as a metaphor for human beings who, who can have multiple philosophies. You know, a, a tick has to have a parasitic philosophy. It has no really other way to survive. And, uh, but a human can have a parasitic philosophy or any other number of 
philosophies. There's a section on hypocrisy and progress. Um, hypocrisy, on the one hand, is is the uh, sometimes I call it the one sin of relativism. It is possible to judge a person on their hypocrisy and relativism because you are judging them by their own philosophy, not by my philosophy, but by their philosophy. So I can't judge someone that way. On the other hand, um, when we're talking about the pair of philosophies, uh, if we believe in progress, then we need a philosophy that is different from that philosophy that's deducible from our behavior. In other words, we'll have an idealized philosophy that we won't always be living up to. That's the only way to have progress, because then here's where I am, this actual worldview that I have, and there's the worldview I want. And the way I make progress to that is through this fact that they're different and separate. That, that gives it a direction for me to go and to grow in. So, um, so I think you know we all have to flirt with hypocrisy if we want to have progress at all. Um, there's a way to get out of being called a hypocrite with the negative connotations just by being honest. And if you do make a mistake or you do, um, you know, break the rules of your own philosophy and maybe break a rule that you said you would never break, then you can admit it and, and sort of that way you. Through honesty, you're not a hypocrite, but there's still a similar kind of thing in the sense that you will be breaking the rules of your idealized philosophy. So I don't want this to be like permission for anybody um, to to break the rules of their philosophy. Uh, I just want it to be something that makes that keeps people looking at at their behavior and comparing it with their idealized philosophy. There's a section on the will. I've talked a lot about the will on on YouTube lately. Okay. Um, there's also going to be um, a glossary of terms. So using the, the, the extension and intentional analysis and, and various things, um, you know, I've reinterpreted many terms because they were biased in favor of an objectivist kind of view. Um, so I have reinterpreted them these terms. I don't need to throw out a term like knowledge. Uh, I just believe in relative knowledge. So basically, these are the relativistic versions of these terms. And this list is going to get much uh, longer, but I'll just give you uh, a few of them here. Um, that'll be in there. Truth, freedom, knowledge, opposite, love, capitalism, libertarianism. And I'll definitely deal with some phrases, like uh, the first phrase I'll mention now is, it appears to me that this is a phrase that goes in front of anything I ever say. Um, I don't even have to say it because I don't want to say it appears to me that blah, blah, blah. It appears that, that would be too repetitive. But it, it's understood. And not only when I say something, but if you say something. If somebody says to me, hey, I know X, Y, Z. I, what I hear is, it appears to me that I know X, Y, Z. That, that's how that works. You know, in some of these terms, you know, it's not that I'll have a concrete definition. For example, dealing with love. Um, that's not something I think that's going to have a concrete definition. But I will be able to talk about it and I want to talk about it because um, it's about relationships and I think relativity being about relationships is basically saying that you can't know a thing in itself but you can know its web of relationships. Um, love is a relationship. It's a word describing a relationship so I think um, it can be dealt with a little bit uh, even in an analytic way uh, if you use relativity. So. Yes, that maybe that's too much, but part of the point here is just to express this, and, and as I do that, I'll think about it, and I'll be looking at these videos. So, um, so that's the kind of process I do anyway. You know, I've written a lot of things in my life that were only meant for me to read, to see both could I explain it in the first place, and then after I explained it, could I understand what I thought I explained, and then, you know, did it make sense, and so on. And this is kind of a pro part of this process, but on the other hand, you know, I would like feedback. And you have a bunch of sections here, and you can see the kinds of things that I think are important at the foundational level of philosophy. Now, there's a lot of things that are important that are not on the list. This list, you know, politics, um, um, you know, and political philosophy, not going to be in this work because I consider that a fairly high level, um, high level. Uh, part of a philosophy. And what did I say the subtitle is? It's uh, a standard, volume one is a standard model of philosophy. I don't think political philosophy goes at this foundational level. You know, it's up in the attic or something. Um, which again, don't assume I'm using a spatial metaphor of higher is better. No, this foundational things are more reliable. Things higher up are less reliable. We might need them still to survive and they can be very important to us. And um, 
political philosophy is very important, but um, they're subject to to a lot more reworking than things down at the foundational level. So this foundational level is 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 a sets of tools and concepts that um, that I find very reliable, and that's why I'm writing this down. It's something that I can say yes to. Um, you know, it's it's great to talk about something like atheism or things that break down other ideas and deconstruct other ideas. These things maybe need to be broken down, but. Um, if you're an atheist and define yourself as an atheist, for example, fine, you break down theism, but when you're done and theism is no more, you have nothing to agree on. This standard model of philosophy is something that I can assent to, and it's something that can be used to build other ideas. So.